Moin moin, hello there ladies and gentlemen, Don Spector here with another review and today I have for you the CVJ, CVJ VVT-1. Yes, today we are taking a look at this very interesting Bluetooth receiver in the 100... Eh, 30 to 170 buck range depending on where or when you buy it and yeah we check out this uh, <laughs> I think the brand has not done any receiver so far and just a few IMs and they're pretty unknown and yeah we see if this maybe just flies under the radar of everyone for no reason or if it's actually pretty crappy so let's stay directly into it packaging as accessories as usual this is a very nice packaging, I can tell you. It looks very unique, it feels very solid, it looks nice, the color scheme is unique here. And this gold accent, while not being my type, yeah, the magnetic closing mechanism is actually pretty nifty here, staying closed relatively nice. And opening it also looks pretty cool on the inside. Then here you get your guide, which uh, I will tackle on uh, as well soon. And then beneath that, you would get your device, which is this nifty thing here and then you get a charging cable which is beneath that and that's kind of it. And that brings us to the first issue of this product. The guide is not actually um, in great English and it also misses a few things that you might be interested in. For instance, the biggest problem I have here, um, the buh, 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 where's the description of what buttons do which, um, because there is an issue with that, it doesn't tell you what button to press to do that. Uh, let me quickly see here, where was that? <coughs> right here. So that's what I meant. Like this is all the instructions of the different functions, but it's not finished. Like if you read this, you're like, hmm, so what buttons do I need to press to bypass battery? It doesn't specify here. And it also not being like formatted well is really awkward. Like you would have enough space, just move this a bit up here, move this a bit up and you have enough space to give me bullet points and phrase everything out. So it feels like more like a rush job than uh, anything else. Um, so yeah, overall by the packaging I really like, this is very cool looking. And uh, the accessories are a bit lackluster because also this does not come with a case or at least a strap where you can like mount it to your belt or something to your belt hook or something. It just doesn't come with anything. It's just charging cable and that's it. So yeah, uh, a bit lacking. But then next, let's take a look at the actual product. This is the VVT-1 and uh, it's relatively big. Uh, let me see if I can find my BTR-5 or my UP-5 or... Oh yeah, I have the UP-5 here, ladies and gentlemen. That's the UP-5. So you can see how much bigger the VVT-1 is than the UP-5. And the UP-5 was not the smallest. But it came with the uh, accessories, we can strap it on, so it's actually very handy still in day-to-day -day life. Yeah, this thing here not. It's smaller than a smartphone, um, but it's also way thicker as you can see here. Uh, it's similar thick to the UP5, but yeah, generally hmm, in build war. That's where I can give this thing huge praise. I'm not sure in my unboxing if I was positive enough about this. This thing, the whole thing on the outside is actually aluminium, not carbon fiber. But it is, you can see it on the side here, it's thick aluminium and this thing is one machined piece. There is no seams, it's just one piece all around. Like there's no glue edges around this, no molding, anything. I think this might literally just be machined aluminium, but then it's like surface finished so it does look like this. Feels really nice in the hand and it has some heft to it. Like this really, like if you ask me, so uh, can I kill with this? Uh, probably I can. If I hit somebody with this head with this side, yeah, this is a very solid piece of aluminium here. And um, yeah, the good also, at least partly, translate to the volume wheel here. This does not rotate the easiest, so you are not that likely to accidentally rotate it. Although I have to say, uh, usability later, uh, I, sometimes it still happens but it rocks a bit in my pocket like that, but it's not the worst. It just could be a bit better. And also it has this uh, click noise if you turn it on. Not off. So you also know when you have actually turned it on. Uh, the biggest issue though with this wheel is there is some uh, some dead zone. So if you do the click, I could just show you the click comes about here. And now there's dead zone until about here. And after that you get some volume. Um, not in this area here. And that's a bit <laughs> awkward because sometimes I just have very sensitive IEMs and are careful and when I don't have volume, don't have volume and suddenly volume. And you're like, a bit less would be nice. Uh, but yeah. 
just a small issue, right? Because this also is made of aluminium and generally feels well made and I don't think it will fall off or anything else. Then the parts here seem to be well integrated to me. Um, there is a bit of an unevenness around the uh, 3.5 part as you can see here, but it's not a big issue and just anything fit in here that I could think of. Side buttons also felt nice. They have some click to them. It's not the most crunchy click, but they are absolutely fine and they just worked flawlessly. The back here you have a toggle switch for base and bypass, which also has a good click to it. Um, there's a tiny bit of give around it, so you need to move. Okay, you can probably see here, you need to move it a bit first before it then actually then starts clicking over. But it's fine, it doesn't feel bad in any way. And also the printing here is very clear, so you can actually see what you are doing. And last but not least, the USB-C USB -C port is okay integrated. It has a tiny bit of rocking around, like really just ever so slightly. Uh, I wish this would be a bit better integrated, but again, as you can see there, this is just, it's one machine piece here. Like this is like, <laughs> Like, sorry, this is just it feeling so nice in the hand. And it's just overall, it feels like a very well-made device. And for the first try, I can, can congratulate a CVG here. This is pretty damn good. And the biggest problem, minus this uh, volume wheel, I said like it could be a bit like not the uh, death zone here, is actually this, this is just plastic. Like I can't make this nicer than it is, it's just plastic. The printing quality again is totally fine, this is very readable and if you turn it on the LEDs are bright enough, you see them in daylight and uh, they indicate what is the status of the device but it just feels cheap compared to the uni body that you have here. This is great and then you come to this and this is kind of ruining it on the last 10, 10 centimeters of this print, you know. It's overall still, like, I still feel like there's not much to complain in terms of build overall, but damn, if this would have been, like, actually, like, glass, or if this would have been an other aluminium inlet here with some small holes, whoa, this thing would have been premium. But as it stands now, it's, like, 85% premium, and then 10% okay, and the rest is really not good. So overall, um, what I would say the build is good, I still wish this would be glass or an aluminium plate in here, so you can actually... Yeah, you have the exact premium feeling that the unibody otherwise will give you. Okay, next, let's talk about connectivity and power. Yes, this is a Bluetooth receiver and it also connects via USB. And now we come to the next big issue the CVG-1 has. Um, if you connect it via USB-C, well, you are limited to 44 kilohertz or to 48. I'm not sure why, like uh, my UP5 does way more, my up, uh, my uh, uh, BTR5 does way more. Why is this only limited to 48? Like, I, I, I don't understand. Like, this is basically making this useless if you really want to listen to high resolution audio on your desktop. I just can't do that. And I would also now question, because if this is already limited to 48K in uh, USB mod, does it really decode more in Bluetooth or is it also just falling back to 48 internally, even if you would transmit uh, via uh, LDAC that this supports way uh, higher resolution audio? Like, does it fall back to 48? Like, I, I don't know and I, I have no way of telling you because honestly, like, I don't have the exact same track there that is once uh, uh, lossless, in quotes, and once when, yeah, uh, normally encoded, like with 44, 48. Like, I don't have a track to test this. And I'm also not trusting myself and just compressing it and then hoping for the best. Because if you would do a smart compression, depending on the track, it would obviously give you a better result. So, uh, yeah, just take it as you will. Like, as I said, only 48k max via USB, which is definitely a bummer for quite a few. And via Bluetooth, I can't promise you that this will actually do high resolution internal decoding. I don't know. And that brings us then, uh, yeah. So the other things, uh, it's... Bluetooth 5.3, so we have a really new standard here. 5.4 would be better, but it supports all of the codecs I could think of. Uh, LDAC, AAC, Aptex HD, Adaptive, Aptex LL, um, L -L LHDC, for all of those who have weird phones for that. And yeah, AAC worked fine, LDAC worked fine, and also Aptex uh, worked fine to me. So in that regard, like connectivity-wise, it's totally fine. And um, yeah, then power. Um, this is, I think, where uh, you have good news and bad news. Good news is you have balanced and single-ended output, and this gives you an output at 400, uh, respectively 800 milliohms, which is pretty good for a Bluetooth receiver. 
But I have the feeling this might not actually be 800 milliohms on the balanced output. Um, my Sandara definitely gets loud enough and it gets driven well enough. But if I put it on my desktop setup, I still have the feeling it gets a tiny bit better. So I'm not sure if this is real 800 or what's going on. But um, generally this seems to drive most things that I had. And I didn't notice any clipping or anything with my Sandara before it came to like uh, when it was at volumes that I would still tolerate. So it was totally fine there. And also for my Elysia, it's totally fine. Like I'm at loud, around 13 o'clock in balanced output here. And Elysia isn't that power hungry. But then again, if you continue upping the power, like this thing has like basically until here, the moment like almost six o'clock, like it gets way, way, way too loud with Sandara and Elysia. Like I can't listen to that. So I think you should be fine in terms of power with this, with almost all transducers that are actually more usable in mobile or semi-mobile environment. Um, definitely nothing that is really too power hungry, but it, honestly Sandara did pretty good with this and I don't have much complaint. Um, distortion and total harmonic wise, um, yeah, I was not able to distinguish anything that was like too negative here. And the noise floor, uh, it, honestly, even the sensitive IMs I didn't get. Uh, I was fearing worse when I read the spec sheet. Um, and there's an issue we talk about that later we talk about sound, which might explain why there's no noise floor, but okay. Next chapter, software, yeah. Um, up 5, BTR5 and most other Bluetooth receivers come with an at least decent suit of software that gives you like EQ, not the greatest EQ, not real parametric, but it's at least some EQ. Usually you can set filters, you can select standby and a few other small things and CVG decided to give you nothing. This is just how it is. No software and I think that's a missed opportunity when you already have a Bluetooth receiver. Just give it at least a slight software suit. Give me some EQ for it. Let me set like, something. Let me fiddle with it a bit. This is just very bare bones. And um, yeah, I wish there would be more. And then, yeah, usability. So um, I really like the usability of my BTR5. And also the UP5 was totally fine here. And in real life, well, um, unfortunately, this is worse than the UP5 and the BTR5 in most ways. As I said, the manual is not great. The English is just meh. It's not really complete. And then the worst part of all of this is USB audio is finicky. Like really, it only works in like 30% of cases when I just plug it in and it immediately is detected, okay. But then it just doesn't play no audio. So usually what I then do is I turn it off again, get it with a click, then plug USB again, turn it on. And then sometimes it's not working the second try. And so I then turn it first on, then plug USB and then it's working. I've not been able to figure out a pattern why this is not working by USB and why it's not. And that really annoys me with this device. Like, <laughs> just really, really boring, oh, really annoying, I mean. So what was I saying? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, in my pocket, the volume wheel unfortunately does rock around slightly. It's not too bad. And if my pocket is just mostly empty, it uh, is not an issue. But if there's a few other things in my pocket, yeah, it just rotates slightly. And I wish there would be a bit more resistance here so that doesn't happen. And then, um, yeah, last but not least in terms of usability, battery life, uh, they say uh, it's already on spec sheet not great, up to seven hours. Um, if you use some IEMs, you probably only, like just IEMs, right? You, I, I couldn't manage seven, I would say it's more like six and a half maximum. And I assume if you put on headphones, it will d quickly go to like five hours or so. So that's not great. And then the last criticism I have when you talk about usability, well, this has battery bypass, which I love when they thought about this function. So you don't kill your device when you have it in via USB. Press these two buttons for like three, five seconds or so, and then it goes to bypass. But, well, here comes the kicker. If you have it on bypass, it still discharges the battery. So going through a whole day at work, for instance, is not possible because then it just dies at like, uh, like 15 o'clock or so. So like it's still two hours ahead or like one hour ahead of work and it just dies because battery is discharging while being on bypass. Strange enough, if you don't activate bypass, it charges while using and that is really obscure and I just don't understand how that can happen. So there would definitely be improvement potential here as well. And then last but not least, let's talk about sound. And as I said, um, I need to tackle the big issue or a big elephant in the room. Um, there's one other reviewer, um, I think he's from Russia. Um, I have a link his video down below. Um, he has apparently measured it and it has 10 ohms of output impedance. Let this sink in. 
Yes, 10 ohms of output impedance is very, very unusual for uh, Bluetooth receivers. Even for bigger devices, very unusual, because this definitely has the potential of coloring your sound, because most output impedance of IEMs at least is not linear, and even some headphones don't have linear output impedance. So this is not a good idea, like absolutely not. And I can tell you, and I will show you measurement now, this thing does not have uh, one ohm or less than one ohm of output impedance. There definitely is something going on here. If it is 10, 8 or even more output, uh, ohms in output impedance, I can't tell you, I don't have the devices to measure it, but it is here. And that means for IEMs, usually this will turn out a really bassy signature already. Just plugging it in already gives you a bass boost of, I think, like four or five decibels already. And if you then still add the bass toggle, well, that's where the title is coming from. This is giving you uh, like a scarlet mini levels of bass. And I have to say, it was fun listening to it with bass boost on the Super Mix, for instance, because the bass is so ridiculously high. <laughs> but it also doesn't sound great, man. And I would really recommend for the second revision, output impedance down to one ohm or better less than one ohm and then just keep the bass toggle and if you want more bass maybe just add a second level make bass extra or something like that then it would be a device where i would be confident in saying this will sound good with basically everything you plug in and if you want bass you can get bass but as it stands now the problem is the best honestly it sounded with my Zandara. Putting bass boost on gives you a, a tasteful bass boost uh, and mostly sub bass, just a bit of mid bass. <clears throat> Worked really well. But yeah, for IEMs, I just, I can't say the same. Like it's really hit or miss. If you already have mid bass, this gets too much quickly. So um, yeah. But other than that, if you just assume you have something with linear output impedance, um, which Elysia is thankfully for the most part. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah. This sounds totally acceptable. Like I would not say it's the most neutral. It possibly is slightly warmish still leaning. But again, as I said, um, if it doesn't measure uh, outside of the output impedance or the actual output that it gives you like not flat, it's highly unlikely I would notice it in day-to-day -day listening with the same uh, device. So overall, um, as I said, I have the feeling it's balanced, possibly slightly warmer leaning. But again, it can also be because this has 10 ohms of output impedance, right? Maybe even Elysia does react to that in a way that I didn't expect or that is not that measurable to me. So yeah, sound-wise, as I said, uh, the hardware, I should, should say, the hardware is actually pretty good here. Like the USD um, 30, wait, let me quickly open the spec sheet because it said that. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, the uh, 3090 Q2M, that's pretty good DAC chip. And yeah, it also sounds very competent in that to me. Um, yeah, but as I said, uh, due to the 10 ohms of open impedance, yeah, that basically gets thrown off the window in the end. Which then brings me over to the conclusion here. Um, yeah, so while this feels very well made, it's a very solid piece of aluminium and it has most of the functions you would want. Well, the problem that it discharges when you have it plugged in via bypass here is not great. The problem that, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the 10 ohms of open impedance is existing, but you don't have an app and also the cheap plastic on the front. Like, it could have been a really nice recommendation. Like, it would be a really great device if these three issues would not be existing. I could even forgive the 48K limit via USB. Like, that's not a big issue to me. But the problem is there's so many of these bigger and smaller mistakes here that I just can't recommend this. And I would really recommend CVG. Um, make a second revision, keep the exact same chassis, reduce output impedance, and uh, fix the issue with the discharge. And you have a device that I would confidently say, yeah, it's good, like I would recommend it then. But as it stands now, I just can't. And I would also re not recommend you getting it. It's just too like special. If you want the most base, I can see an argument to be made for this device. Like I can see an argument. But most people don't want the most bass. Like that's why Scarlet Mini is just a niche thing and not the thing. So yeah, um, that's it. Um, hope you enjoyed it. If you have uh, questions, if you have recommendations, if you have criticisms, please leave a comment. And with this, don't spectator.